All right, welcome. <clears throat> so, uh, whenever we gather like this and do, you know, prayers and some ritual, I always think of it as like a birthday party. Um, in the in the West, um, you know, as dharmas come west, uh, it's evolved kind of secular dharma and um, um, sacred dharma. So uh, I like doing both. Just earlier, just did a sitting from ten to eleven, just sitting and walking, <clears throat> um, which is nice. No particular prayers or. Although sitting in a circle and a certain way and walking a certain way is ritual, whether you like it or not, we're doing a common activity together. <clears throat> but today's talk is about art, so it involves ritual and behavior. So I see it as kind of like um, when we meet on Sundays, it's uh, like everybody's birthday party. So if we have a birthday party in the West, um, even in Asia, they sing happy birthday. Uh, the silly tune, you know. Um, let's say we invited you to a birthday party um, and you all show up and uh, there's no cake, there's no decorations, and you don't sing happy birthday. And somebody says, well, how come there are no cakes and, you know, decorations, there's no singing? And we go, we don't believe in ritual here. <laughs> so, it'd be kind of a drag for a birthday party, right? You wouldn't have any cake, no singing, no decorations. You just sit there and go, I guess it's your birthday. Let's be aware. Let's be mindful of that. That, that would be okay. I mean, we could have like, oh, I'm going to sit here and be mindful of my birthday. But um, particularly in Vajrayana, we, we like to sit still, and we do that a lot in caves and outside and stuff. But when we get together, we like to have a birthday party. It'd be weird to just kind of go, well, it's birthday, but we didn't get you any presents. <laughs> there's no art, there's no singing, no cake, no decorations. Let's, let's be mindful, it's your birthday. And that's okay too, but uh, we do both in this tradition. We sit quietly and don't do anything other than be aware. And then we also have, you know, some birthday party like that. <clears throat> All of Dharma uh, in Asia is very elaborate, colorful, and artistic. Um, it doesn't matter what school you're looking at. And it's only in the United States, maybe Europe, because I haven't traveled there too much. But um, that you'd have what, what I would call Quaker kind of Dharma. Like, th there's no, you know, you go into the friends meeting hall, th there's absolutely no anything, right? It's just maybe a circle or it's totally plain. Even congregationalists, you know, have like maybe a little, or Presbyterian, like a little brass cross or something, but that's Quaker style, right? No, no representation, right? It's very plain, <clears throat> which is okay too. But um, I just wanted to point out historically that all the Dharma traditions in coming from Asia are very artistic and elaborate and have tons of ritual, right? So um, uh, that's, that's important. But our tradition, when I say our tradition, I mean the Vajrayana tradition probably has for meditation purposes, the greatest use of images and art, the greatest um, emphasis on visualization and um, the enactment of art, which would be ritual, or as I say, birthday party. <clears throat> it has the um, probably the most emphasis on our imagination. So I use imagination and ritual kind of uh, and uh, visualization somewhat interchangeably, but um, particularly imagination is when we're having to create something new. So right now you could say, well, look at Medicine Buddha uh, tanka on the wall over there and you could say visualize that. So, you know, close your eyes and can you see it? 
um, imagination would also be you're adding something to it or you're, you're bringing something new to it. <clears throat> In our meditations, we, we like to um, work with the ability of the mind to create, the ability of us to find new uh, areas of expression so that we're not just um, visualizing as a copy, but we're also creating something new. And it's important to know the difference in our tradition. Sometimes we do want someone to just go, okay, can you visualize it? Go right there. So if you're giving directions to um, uh, like Coit Tower or something in San Francisco, um, can you visualize it? You know, you, you know, we're talking about Coit Tower. Can, do you know what, can, and people, someone goes, yeah, I see it, or Golden Gate Bridge or something. Uh, then you actually, in, and you say, I want you, I want to meet with you there this afternoon. You want their visualization to be pretty accurate, right? <laughs> You'd be annoyed. <laughs> you say, can you see it? Can, you know what I'm talking about. Put, yeah, got it. You know, okay, go there. Um, however, if you're doing some dream work or you're um, sitting at the beach with someone, um, and maybe it's romantic time or something like that. You're in Carmel and blah, blah, and you've got a really nice place to stay, and blah, blah. So you can be sitting on the beach and kind of go, I'd like, I'm just imagining our life together, right? So that's going to be a little bit different, right? That, that, that's, you know, everyone's going to have a little bit, uh, a little bit different, and it might be actually fun. Um, to say, you know, I, I imagine we're doing this, and the other person, I imagine we're doing this. Um, if you have a fairly, um, maybe <laughs> a fairly stiff partner, <laughs> your partner might, I visualize us, and this is what it looks like, and that's it, you know. Uh, and but if you have it, you know, another kind of partner, the partner goes, I don't know, I could visualize ourselves south of France, or I could visualize ourselves, you know, just. Um, Maybe in South Central LA, it doesn't matter. You know, just kind of whatever. Uh, so it's very imaginative. <clears throat> so for in our tradition, we train to both. Like we want to have the same visualization somewhat, so we can arrive at the same place at the same time. And we also want imagination, so that uh, we have a sense of freedom and creativity, and uh, you know, generate uh, some interdependent and um, uh, creative uh, connection, right? Because if it's just doing the same thing, then um, it, it's good. You arrive at the same place at the same time, and you don't step on each other's toes. But there's there's not quite the the bliss and the juice, right? So when people share creativity, um, and it's slightly different but harmonized, then in our tradition, we call that the union of bliss and wisdom. If we're merely copying, uh, you know, and getting the right answer, um, that's important. That's, in a way, the beginning of the path, because we want people to drive on the right-hand side of the road. That's the right answer. But um, it wouldn't be a very fun journey if you were silent in the car the whole time, and, and somebody says, what's your journey all about? And then you went, um, I'm just driving on the right-hand side of the road. That's all I know. And they go, aren't you, you know, should go into Ocean Beach and having lunch at, well, Cliff House is closed down. I don't know, it's opened up, closed down? Anybody been there? It's closed, yeah. So that's, that's kind of imagining, oh, this is gonna be great, we're, we're going to Ocean Beach, and then we're gonna have some oysters at Cliff House, and then maybe we'll go to the park, blah, blah, blah. But you might be riding with someone who says, I don't care about that, I, I just want you driving on the right-hand side of the road. Those two people can get along, but um, we, we wanna know which is which. So it's important in our tradition when we're using images and ritual to to actually be literally on the same page, just like we're doing in the prayers, but then um, also be able to use imagination, saying, "Well, when I when I think I'm uh, 
feeling aware and blissful and loving, it looks like this to me. And the other person goes, wow, that's really me because when I'm thinking I'm aware and blissful and loving, I, I kind of look like this or I see us doing this. And, and then the two kind of uh, can uh, melt together a little bit and then you create a uh, new being, right? That's called like, then you have a baby. <laughs> so think maybe you adopt a kid like, I have this idea, I have this idea, and then interdependence happens, and then you have a totally new idea, right? <clears throat> but uh, if you have exactly the same idea uh, image, then that's when you both go to the pound and you get a cat or a dog you can agree on, right? <laughs> so we need, we need both. We need a reality where you can totally agree on it so we don't crash into each other. And then we need a reality that um, uh, is, is fluid and opening like that. <clears throat> so um, both of these can use images, but also uh, mind images, which are sometimes thoughts. Thoughts happen with images too, don't you think? Yeah, they do. Um, so, uh, in, in our particular school, um, we like to have both. We like to have the imaginal side that um, as a creative, it might be slightly different. We like the visualization side where we're um, all agreeing, uh, like, you know, that's water and that's the floor and that's the right hand side of the road. And uh, some of the luminaries in our tradition um, have been able to pull that off. Um, one of the big luminaries, of course, um, Lama Sankapa, who was very creative, imaginative, but also visualized and created uh, a situation where we could uh, both see the same world at the same time. So that, that, that is very unique. That's what we're trying to preserve here, where uh, we're all coming here and we're sitting nice, <laughs> doing prayers, but every one of us is having a slightly different experience, right? you're seeing slightly different images. You're seeing slightly different internal world, but at the same time, we're also doing kind of the same thing. That's the way reality actually works. If we were all doing totally different things, we probably wouldn't even come together as a group, right? We wouldn't, we'd, or we'd be crashing into each other. If we're doing totally the same thing, it would be a little bit cult-like, right? We're here because we don't really, don't really want a cult, do we? Yeah. Maybe we've joined cults. I don't know. Like, cults don't have to be religious cults. They could be, you know, sports cults or, you know, I don't know. They could be artistic cults. Like everybody does it. the same, just copies each other. <clears throat> so in our tradition, we just don't use images um, on, on, uh, uneducatedly we we see images express themselves in visualizations and in imagination so here like the tankas the paintings um they're pretty uh um normative so that someone coming in could go um oh that's kala chakra and that's medicine buddha but uh for those of you that are familiar with um images and temples, everyone's actually, the artist has done it a little bit differently each time. They, they don't look exactly alike. They're, they're going to have a little different smile or different background. The artist, the Tonka artist, uh, always managed to, you know, do something a little different. You, you could, if really good people can go, oh, that was painted by so-and-so. It's like if you're a musician, you could say, oh, that's Horowitz playing Tchaikovsky, or that's Lang Lang playing, you know, that you're that good, you know people. So even though it's kind of standardized, uh, each, each one that we see here is a little bit different. And that, that's an important thing that we, as meditators and yogis, we can see sameness and difference at the same time. That's Buddhahood. We can see sameness and difference at the same time, not get rattled. We're seeing interdependence right down the middle. 
Whereas usually when we're stuck in samsara, it's like all I see is difference or all I see is sameness. Think about it in your daily life, you know, think about it now, like do you spend your time on sameness or do you spend your time on difference? Too much sameness is a problem too, right? You miss a lot if you just look at sameness. But you also miss a lot if you're over on the side of too much difference. So uh, the visualization, the, the visual images um, are useful because uh, we can quickly determine if we know the proper way is like, are we, are we meditating on sameness like a visualization? We want everything standardized. Or are we doing meditating a little bit on difference, like people are bringing a little different imagination, vision to it. It's difficult to do that um, if you're just paying attention to breath. It's difficult to do that if you're just paying attention to just mental states or um, emotional states. So in America, most people like, okay, meditation on breath, which is great, right? Um, but the breath varies a lot, right? It's a little harder with the breathing to tell like if you're totally paying attention or not. But with the visualization, uh, which is standardized, then um, you know, you'll know right away when you drift off because it's not automatic like your breath, right? Am I tracking? Yeah. Much harder, I think. But the, the, generally, the, the way I was taught, very traditionally, actually starting like shamatha, you know, okay, so visualize, visualize the Buddha in front of you and do that for 24 minutes. And when you're distracted, just come back. And it sounds really easy, right? It's hard to visualize anything precisely that even, even that we're very familiar with. So all the time I say, like, visualize Golden Gate Bridge. So you go, okay, I got Golden Gate Bridge. Keep it in front of your mind. No other distractions, no other thoughts. Just Golden Gate Bridge and visualize it. How long can you do it for? A minute, two minutes? We might start doing a little bit of imagination with it after that. We might go, okay, I've got Golden Gate Bridge, but now I've got Golden Gate Bridge with um, people walking across it. And now I've got Golden Gate Bridge with cars driving across it. Now I've got Golden Gate Bridge in the fog. Now I've got the elevated view of Golden Gate Bridge, like some photo or something. Now, you know, like we start messing with it, right? We still have Golden Gate Bridge we're visualizing, but you know, we, we've moved away from the exactness. It gives us much more feedback very quickly, but it's also more frustrating. I don't know, maybe, maybe there are a few people here who are like um, natural visual, visualizer, imagination people, like just see it and you can just stick with it. But it's difficult, don't you think? Some profound artists are like that. You can just, they'll just see it. They'll just have it. Um, you know, the, like full blown and they'll, they'll just stick with it. So uh, maybe Mozart was like that. You know, it's like, just, I don't know. You just saw, saw the whole symphony and the whole opera all once and just had to spend time drawing it out, right? There was a famous movie, um, Amadeus, years ago. Um, I don't know if it's fictional or not, but uh, anybody see that movie? Probably, yeah, okay, good. So that was, uh, uh, you know, Salieri was um, being petitioned by Mozart's wife to grant, uh, you know, uh, an opera to Mozart because he was broke. and. So Constanza brought in some of the sheets, right, of music. And um, Sally was going, God, this, this is good. You know, he's just kind of tripping. And then he said, um, uh, this is great. You know, can, can I keep these copies and just look through it? And what did Constanza say? You remember? No, you can't keep them. Why? They're originals. No, nothing crossed out, nothing changed, right? No, no erasures, like Beethoven's notebooks are full of like ink blots and <laughs> things like that, you know, changing stuff. He was very imaginal. Mozart just like, I think it's true on one of them, like it just like on a clown and knocked music or something like 
just or maybe it was uh, the um, overture to Don Giovanni. Wrote, wrote it the night before. Whole thing, one city, one city. I don't know. Music. A few musicians are here. You, you know what that would be like? It'd just be like writing like Moby Dick, one sitting. No corrections. No, pro, you know, just it, right? So that's that's like the pure visualization. Like it just that's it. It just stays there like that. So there are a few geniuses that could do this, you know, Buddha, you know, Yashid Sogyal, Padmasambhava, different people. Most of us are, are gonna kind of go off and we can fuse visualization and imagination, right? Just like memory. But um, very, you know, real geniuses, uh, okay, they can do the visualization and they can do the imagination and you know when you're when you're on one or the other. It's just like when you know, we're telling stories. Robert, could you grab the door and just pull it back a little? Yeah, thanks. <clears throat> so I'm just going because I know I'm talking to a few yogis here, and I'm sorry if I'm not giving a general talk about how to be a nice person. Um, but there are plenty of those talks already, right? We should all be nice people. and. Don't be jerks, you know. Um, so my um, clinical manager, uh, Colleen Wong at um, Middleway Health, she, she has a bumper sticker on, <laughs> on the back of her car. Has anybody seen it? Jen seen it? So the Buddha, the Buddha it's, it's regular kind of Buddha image. And then it says, don't be a dick. <laughs> So I think, you know, that's the use of an image, right? So you've got a standardized image, and then you've got an imaginal. So we laughed, you know? So that coming together of the, you know, the standardized image and the creative imaginal image, the visualization image, then that comes together and we laugh, right? That's the bliss-filled wisdom, you see. You have to bring those two together, and a little spark is created. This is why this tradition is so profound, because usually people are just thinking, I just want to do one thing and leave me alone. I want to either be, you know, make up my own version, uh, you know, uh, DIY Dharma, or I want to be totally like, I want to get it totally right and get the five gold stars for being a good Dharma student. But actually, it, it's a connection. So there's the normative, and then there's a little bit eccentric, and then if you can hold those together long enough, then you get this little spark. That's what we're trying to do here. But holding it together means that um, we have to um, train a lot in concentration. That's why there's a big emphasis I put on uh, just the meditation. So. Um, even before we do any visual or imaginal practice, we have to do a lot of just, uh, you know, just sitting there and being present, right? There's, there's no way around it. So um, the good news is if you do a lot of sitting, you'll develop a lot of concentration. Um, the bad news is just like if you practice a lot, you'll get to Carnegie Hall. But the bad news, if you don't do very much, you won't get to Carnegie Hall. Right. It's, it actually is very much dependent upon time put in. Rats. Because <laughs> you must you must have the concentration ability, the rep repetition, the returning to the object of concentration, like that you must have it. <laughs> mm. So uh, I have a lot more to say about this because it's really a big deal. Um, <clears throat> it, it, this, you know, the the normative and the you know, I call it visualization and imagination, but the, the normative and the creative part uh, also are true for scholarship. So the same kind of creative dynamic goes on where we <laughs> we want you to get some key concepts really down, so you have complete absolute certainty and then we also want you to have a creative way that you express or embody those concepts or 
realizations or truths, really. So uh, we really, really, we, we <laughs> the Nis teachers want you to like, really get interdependence, okay? I just want you to get that. And you, you have to understand it in a way intellectually first. Because if you have a misunderstanding, then you do all these other kinds of practices, it, it won't really stick. That's the sad part about it. So if you have a delusion, like the, like the earth is flat, or Trump won the election or something silly, then there's no way you can move forward. You just, you won't go on a trip around the world, right? If you have basic delusions and you haven't examined the delusions uh, through logic and uh, investigation and intellect uh, and ex experiment, if some of the fundamental things are totally delusional, even if you do all the energy practices, all the visualizations and imaginations, even if you're a really good person and you know you sacrifice yourself, you won't get it. That's why you know we have to have some basic certainty like we're in the United States, we drive on the right hand side of the road. If you're here and you kind of go, well, I don't know which thing I'm doing, then you're going to be in trouble. Or maybe I should reverse it. If you're really not clear, like, so um, that, that was the case, like real thing. So when I was at the monastery, they go, hey, you know, do you want to, you want to go driving? Because they have a lot, of, you know, they have drivers like, Lama, do you want to drive? And I said, no, you know why? First of all, it's scary as all get out. But the second part is why? Because I did not have certainty that I would stay on the left-hand side of the road. Because habit is so strong, right? So I could say, I'm a really good driver in the United States, but I wouldn't be driving very well in Britain or in India. It's so easy to make those stupid mistakes, right? Anybody driven in India? Yes, no, yeah, so. It's scary, <laughs> but you want absolute certainty that you can do some function, right? I don't want to like, I don't want to go under a surgery with a surgeon that you know hasn't, frankly, done done the procedure before. So when I had some procedure on my hand from Kaiser, and I'll say nice things about Kaiser, it actually was okay. You know, I was interested. And you know, how many hand surgeries have you done? Right? You want to be, you want to have certainty, right? So it's important to have intellectual certainty. Intellectual certainty doesn't mean you're going to have the experiential realization as a result of it. But if you don't have it, the chances are you won't have the experiential. Because you're driving on the wrong hand side of the road. So that's why in our tradition, we have put an emphasis on you know, logic and study. So that there isn't like, when, when you have realization, when you have Buddhahood, when you've uh, realize the nature of mind when you've attained Rigpa, suddenly, you know, that doesn't mean like the laws of logic are, you know, no, it's still logical. Otherwise, it wouldn't be much use, right? I can say, I'm realized, but I don't know what country I'm in or whether I should drive on the right hand or the left hand side of the road. You'd be dangerous, right? So we've seen many false teachers that say, okay, I have this experience of this or that, but um, they, they don't understand the workings of karma and they don't understand uh, logic and it's been a problem, right? We want to be logical no matter what, don't we? Please say yes. Yeah, good. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, this is why the great teachers, uh, in teach contemporary teachers that I've studied with are really good scholars on top of being good meditators, right? They're no, they're no stupid meditators. Stupid meaning like if you still are really on, you know, if you still have intellectual uncertainty about like uh, emptiness, about nature, mind, the chances are, you know, your experience will fold into the uncertainty. So the classic thing is if you have a pot or a teacup that has dirt in it, even if you put, you know, fun, nice water in it, it'll be a problem, right? So even Jesus was saying, don't put new wine into old bottles, right? We have to kind of clean and we have to get very clean, clear. And the more we have the certainty, the more the experience is going to be able to come to fruition. Because we do want experiential um, uh, 
uncontrived non-conceptual awareness but the odd part is you can't you can't leap over the conceptual certainty let's have a quick discussion because maybe some people think well no you can leap over it and then you don't need to do that so what i'm interested so we have a few minutes if i haven't totally bored and confused you then if you want to have something to say and we'll have announcements about Tenzin Choki's visit too and stuff like that but and some of you may never come back again as a result of this talk but I just had to say it <laughs> does anybody want to say anything we could we could break early Jose has something thank you thank you <laughs> <laughs> so um, my question is, is because you mentioned the Tankas, and I'm fascinated by them as well. But my question is, um, where where does that idea come from? I mean, who, um, where where did that start? I mean, is it a reflection? Do you think of maybe the geography of of Tibet or Nepal? I mean. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm just generally curious about it. You know, I mean, I've seen many and many of them, and they're all different. But I'm just, but you mentioned that about art and about something, you know, I, I forget exactly how you, actually, how you actually mentioned it, but, um, you know, there has to, there's, there's a, a certain lineage, perhaps, and then, but there's always a variation. So I'm just curious about it. Um, well, it's all Indian, for starters. I mean, like, um the maybe because of the nomadic um style uh uh you know then, then they can roll up and they're easily transportable so the idea of having things painted on canvas and transportable but um uh you know everything really started in india but uh uh in nepal they really evolved a little bit uh, a big piece of metalworking and stuff like that, but every Nepal's part. When we say India, Nepal was is part of India, so it's all Indian really. So um, India is very colorful. So there are tons of statues and paintings on everything. It's just um, this particular style where you have, you know, it's framed by the brocade, and uh, you you can actually roll it up and hang it this way. You know, came to be you know kind of uniquely Tibetan. Yeah, but the the way the um, Buddha devas appear, um, you know, it's uh, you know definitely from India. Like that, but people had visions, right? Buddhas appear a certain way, and people say, "Well, I you know like for him, Chenrezig he looks like this," and then got a painter to paint it. So I had a vision of Tara, so I had my friend uh, Wataro do the Tara Madonna behind you. So it's like that. <laughs> so that's a combination of visualization and imagination because, um, you know, teachers can come here and they can see it as Tara, but it's also very different, right? There's no Tara in Tibet or India that has holding a baby Buddha, right? It's totally new. Oh, la la. <laughs> Hi. Okay, so I'm going out on a limb here. I'm brand new. Oh, cool. Um, these teachings have always lived in my heart, but I was born into a religious, strict religious <laughs> life that I never fit into, and I finally burst out of that. Now I'm in a place of limitless, limitlessness. Um, there's no more fences. And what I'm finding is there are certain things my soul is certain of. Is there anything in particular I ought to aim for certainty of in order to be a part of this congregation um the certainty is like if we're 
if we're living from a misperceived situation, if we don't see things as they are, we're, we're going to suffer and others will suffer along with us. So things as they are doesn't mean just out there external things as they are like, how, what is it to be a human being? So the Buddha said, well, I'm, a, I'm awake to things as they are. So uh, fundamentally the tradition has to do with um, overcoming ignorance. So human beings are fundamentally good, uh, but uh, we, we get caught up in delusional ideas and behaviors and create a lot of suffering. So um, we, we aim for like not just intellectual certainty, certain, seeing things as they are, but actual experiential you know, truth, right? So the whole point of Dharma is to see the truth, to live the truth. So the Buddha did make some normative um, statements about what he saw as the truth, right? It isn't just like, it's not a skeptical position. But he said, you know, the truth is everything's incredibly interconnected. And if we miss that, then we're gonna suffer. If we, if we think we're totally separate beings, we think our behavior doesn't influence others or people influence us, if we think we're like just a billiard ball so all alone on the billiard table, it's, it's not like that. We're radically interconnected. So that was his realization. That. So we, we want to get, we, we want to make that a living truth for ourselves. And to that extent, we, we have all these different um, yogas, so to speak. It's really kind of simple. But people are complicated, so different explanations and practices evolve to deal with people's complications. There were, you know, some extraordinary people during the time of the Buddha were just, they, they were already meditators, but he, he would just say stuff like, everything's connected and they would just wake up on the spot. But we've all had that experience where somebody said something that we heard it at just the right time and it was a turning point, don't you think? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Good question. Mama, I I have a feeling about rituals that that is kind of uh, positive and negative, and that's because what I observe in myself and in others is that uh, a ritual maybe um, start with a meaning, with a meaningful experience, and people know what what the meaning of the experience is. But um, over time, we can, there is kind of a tendency to go into mechanics and just doing things without remember why we are doing, just repeating things that we heard and doing things without understanding what we, we are doing. It's almost over time we get used to the ritual and we fall asleep, comfortable, and I see this this in, in most of religions that that in some point was very, very meaningful rituals. And over time, a huge number of people doing and in, in ignorance without knowing what, what they are doing. So my, my, my concern, my question would be how we prevent from falling asleep, feeling, feeling comfortable in the, in the ritual? Basically, we, I, you know, we have to wake up. <laughs> That's the basic thing. Um, the sad part is it, it isn't just religion, you see. Uh, we're, we have habitual behavior all the time. Just the way we brush our teeth, walk, talk to people. Usually our habits um, are very unconscious and Lots of times they aren't very helpful, and those are rituals. So habits are rituals, you know, like how we do, you know, how we do everything, greet each other and, you know, do birthday parties and everything. So um, all kinds of behaviors do become totally um, unconscious and kind of automatic. Some are very useful, like 
I want the ritual where I'm going to drive on the right hand side of the road, you know, see, be automatic like that. So they're, they're positive habits. So we're trying to build positive habits because we can't be spontaneous and new all the time. Also, if you want to get a bunch of people together, they have to be, have some kind of coordination or it's just cacophony, right? Or people are just milling around. But in our tradition, we always want to be aware of the motivation and the meaning uh, purpose of what we're doing. So um, I've been a number of talks that Dalai Lama goes, well, if you're just reciting the Mani Mantra like a parrot, it's not going to do much good. So if you're just doing this ritual, you know, yeah. So there, there has to, the mind and the motivation have to be engaged in doing it. But it, it's easy to be a parrot, yeah. But we don't want to be a parrot in the rest of our lives either. We want to be very, we want to be awake, right? So I totally agree. I would just extend it over the whole human thing whenever we're doing stuff that is very um, unconscious and um, performative. There's a danger it becomes you know, really static. Not or magical, right? I'll just do this and something magically will happen. <laughs> yeah, I agree. Yeah, good. Very good. Thank you. Anything else? My, oh, yes. Dirk has a hand up. Yeah, no. Obama, uh, am I coming through? Yes. Yay. Um, it's, it's an interesting thing that in uh, our culture and our language, when we talk about imagination, we put the visual at the center, at the highest level, part of you know the success of movies and photography. And, um, but your, so your example of Mozart was right, really right to the point, I felt, because Mozart didn't see music, he heard music. You know, you could still call it visualization and he, because that's the word that we have, just like the word art also relates to visual art, but it's not exclusively visual art. So Mart Mozart, I think, uh, and also the Tibetan tradition has a lot of music that they do. Yeah. So I think the, uh, I think uh, it's good to uh, visualize beyond just what the eyes see, I guess is all I'm saying. And I hadn't really thought of that until I heard your talk, so thank you. Oh, thank you. Yeah, so of course, usually um, in our tradition and Zen tradition too, uh, you know, sometimes you're asked to formally ex uh, express some realization through, through poetry. So um, uh, I'm not really good enough to write good poetry, but um, I've tried. But uh, you know, with language and music, any any of the arts, even um, the the art of like putting together a fundraiser <laughs> at the Dante Event Center. You know, these are um, these uh, take that mixture of uh, uh, you know certainty and imagination like that. So yeah, thank you for pointing out. It's not just strictly physical imagery, but can be um, intellectual and um, musical and poetic. Dance too, right? Yeah. Even food, right? <laughs> yeah, even food. <laughs> I live with a foodie, so yeah, even food. Now, some people have incredible like taste. They can just say, well, this has a little bit of this in it. <laughs> you know, I, I don't taste anything. It's just a hot dog, you know. <laughs> yeah, like that. Hi. Oh. One of the things that I like about so much is about the the tonkas is the flowers that manifest in in the sky. Yeah. They kind of rain down from the sky. Yeah. And I was wondering if that there's a message in that about um mind and creation and um i don't know like flowers from the sky or just flowers flowers from the sky flowers in heaven or whatever you know they're floating sometimes in space 
Yeah, that's kind of interesting. That would be like, that would be someone's like PhD dissertation because um, one, <laughs> like one of the ways you, you would call an opponent in a debate like an idiot, you would say that's like a sky flower, right? Doesn't exist. Um, but then uh, there are many descriptions, particularly uh, the Buddha's enlightenment also his parinirvana when uh, flowers uh, spontaneously, you know, fell from the sky. And of course, flowers are big. The basic metaphor is all the Buddhas are arising from flowers. And of course, we, then we have Padmasambhava, you know, so um, they're all coming from flowers. So the idea of the lotus and the, on the, that keeps opening up that style of lotus that keeps on, you know, the petals keep on opening up is huge. But um, yeah, so one of the, when you read the stories, the Mahasiddhas or, you know, and, and then things are, things are appearing uh, out of the sky, out of nothing, it's really incredible. Or then, you know, visualizations of um, skies or Buddha, you know, Buddhas or flowers in the sky. So, um, those, those are real interesting states of mind where the, suddenly there's nothing and then something appears, right? <laughs> but those are important practices, advanced practices to work with. Um, that kind of, uh, usually um, in the lower yanas, you're, you're gradually building up the visualization or gradually building up the imagination you know, because it's spelled out like this is what Tara looks like, or this is what um, Chen Rezi or the Buddha looks like, and going into vast detail. But of course, for those familiar like with, um, you know, some of the sadhanas, particularly like Dujin Rinpoche, uh, uh, you know, you instantly appear as Ekajati, that's it, you know, just like, because that's the way it is, just things instantly appear. You know, so um, that's the funny part is uh, from one perspective, it appears that things are gradually um, evolving and, and, you know, growing or, or forming. Um, but uh, from kind of Dzogchen perspective, like everything is, is there all at once and um, you know, in, instantaneous like that. So, um, that's a whole nother kind of interesting thing. <clears throat> yeah, but flowers, you know, just usually means in, if something appears, if it feels like it appeared out of nowhere, it means it's always been there. Just as a yoga tip, if it feels like, like suddenly out of nowhere, you know, no, that means that means suddenly you turned your head there was, it was always there, you know, like that. So of course that's that's the interesting thing about the uh, Zogchen approach is it's instantaneous uh, and it's always been there at the same you know so um, that's why flowers and um, are are so interesting uh, so much a part of Dharma because they 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 have this sense of instantaneous um, fully grown um, and. Uh, growth at the same time, like kind of like Garuda, you know, Garuda bird. Do you have your hand up? No? Okay. One other person? Okay. Thanks. Thanks, Lama. You remind me of a, a story, and I'm not sure if I remember it entirely, but there was a sitarist who um, all of a sudden wanted to go to a guru and learn about enlightenment. And I think the story goes, he was afraid he'd have to give up his sitar or something. And the guru um, told him to use the sitar, I believe, help me if you've heard this one, um, to use the sitar, but not to focus on the technique or the rhythm or the melody, but just to like meditate on the sound of each note and to make that his meditation and go into a cave and just use the sitar as his practice. And um, I didn't really fully understand like the kind of the import, like how 
it ended for the sitarist in the terms of because now when we're talking about visualization and you know imagination he, he, he on a way it's kind of like i don't know maybe straddling the worlds or something just focusing on the meditation i'm not sure um maybe you can help explain the story to me if you, if you remember it um or what the because as a as someone trying to learn an instrument if you just sit there and it's great to just focus on one note but you don't really get anywhere but maybe it's like sometimes when you're trying to meditate and to like learn the instrument it's it's it seems like one or the other and uh and i was i was really intrigued by that story because he was seemed to be saying something really interesting to actually use an instrument as your practice but um yeah it's i didn't really understand it well the buddha and the master is always you know we're always trying to like look you know if someone's got a particular activity have them find the truth in that activity so uh dharma is a little bit difficult because um we're we're asking somebody to in a way pay attention to the kind of union of opposites to use kind of western terms so um something's happening and nothing's happening at the same time so you, so there's appearance but uh it, it uh it's it's empty at the same time so uh that's why lama sankapa said you know we uh we show emptiness through appearance and we show appearance through emptiness like that usually we're splitting the world right so we want to look at both sides you know things things that are growing and instantaneous at the same time they're gradual and sudden at the same time it's very weird but you know whatever discipline artistic discipline we have we, we still need the concentration so the sitar player had to be very concentrated <laughs> say okay i'm just going to practice this one song for the next 12 years you know people do stuff like that they go so deep and then you know they just take one thing and they really get into it you know so that that's important we need that usually people don't succeed unless they have a certain level of intensity you, you can't really be you can't you can't jump to just kind of effortlessness it has to the buddha talked about effort at the very end right practice diligently so so do effortlessness through effort right Things like that good question Hi there. Hi. Oh, it's for the oh. people. Oh. Yeah, it's on. Thank you. So it sounds to me what you're reminding us is is that moment and please forgive me i forgot if it was in chemistry or organic chemistry where you're basically come to the understanding that at an atomic level everything is actually moving even though i'm sitting in a solid chair right so even the atoms in this wood of this arm of this chair the atoms in the fabric of this chair the atoms in the cushion of this chair are actually all independent and moving and yet at the same time making a solid object and it please correct me if i'm wrong but it sounds like you're asking us to remain in that space where we recognize both are equally true at the same time that you have a solid state which is this chair and yet at an atomic level it is ultimately moving and that both remain true and that that is what we need to abide in to make sure that we are remembering both yeah so that's a good point you know so um there's a special way that we see the complementarity of reality without becoming logical idiots so you know and complementarity meditations like Dzogchen, you're not just saying like the same thing is both it not itself and not itself at the same time. So that's the that's the difficult part is sometimes people mistake this um, uh, complementary manifestation 
of emptiness appearance to be the same as something is both what it is and what it isn't at the same time. And that, that's kind of a logical mistake. So, um, but, and we're trying to point out something that complementary in, in a real way, but not illogical. Um, because once you start talking about entities, um, of course, an entity can't be both itself and not itself at the same time. So how do you talk about things from a non-entity, non-reification point of view? And that's why it's, it's kind of difficult, you know, and it has to be expressed sometimes artistically and poetically, because uh, if you try to express it with wrong logic, then you'll drive on the left-hand side of the road in the United States. So our disciplined yogis like ourselves, we're, we're actually logical, but we're also um, uncontrived and non-conceptual at the same time. A lot of times people think, well, non-conceptual meditation, direct experience, uh, transcends logic. Actually, it doesn't. You don't have to transcend logic, because logic is just the way things are. It's not a problem. Like, we don't have to transcend our bodies to become enlightened, right? So the body works just fine. You know, I, I don't want my elbow to go, <laughs> you know, 45 degrees that way, right? I want my eyes to work. I don't want to transcend my eyes when I'm using my eyes. I want my eyes just to work, function perfectly. So um, that's, you know, the, the way, you know, these wonderful teachers like Yuram Shea and Yashit Sogil and Sam Kappa and, um, you know, uh, Nipam Rinpoche, you know, wanted to keep, keep that kind of balance, like of, you know, Dujim Rinpoche, you know, keeping, keeping that balance where we're having uncontrived direct experience, but it's not, um, it's not in opposition to um, the, the logic world, you see. Otherwise, it'd be a problem. You'd be, people would be unrelatable. You know, so, you, you know, that, that's the thing. We have to be, re, we, it's interdependent, meaning relatable. That's interesting. Glad, thanks for bringing that up. Yeah. Well, uh, great. What, last question. Oh yeah, yeah. No more. Like everyone has been realized and is happy. Leave with bliss. Okay, and then announcements. Thank you. Um, so I uh, have a series of uh, messages back and forth with uh, Geshe Domsho this morning, and he wanted me to pass on some things. Uh, he says hello to everyone. Um, he's doing well. Uh, his days are going well. It's raining a lot in Dharamsala right now, so um, he's you know getting soaked everywhere he goes. Uh, but he wanted to say hi, let you know that he's doing well, his studies are going well, and um, it, yeah. So if you guys have WhatsApp or whatever, and you have contact with him, you can do that. Or if you want to send a message through me, I'm happy to do that and pass it on. And um, we can just send a group message um, later one of these Sundays again. Um, he seemed to enjoy that. Um, so yeah. Uh, and then I think you're going to say something about the 22nd of July. Well, I think Susan's probably or Susan's going to say gonna something. Say something. But, um, yes. Yeah. You know. Um, so I encourage people to to sign up and to see um, Tenzin Shoki. Uh, you know, even even if you've heard it before, you know, it's like it, it's impossible to hear about um, Brahma Viharas or compassion or bodhicitta or anything. Uh, we should be constantly repeating it. So um, one of the uh, one of the Dharma test questions: if 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 you get if you get sick of hearing about compassion or kindness, then um, you have to work on it more, right? If you say, I just want to keep hearing about it, then of course you will. But uh, it's kind of like Pema Chodin would say, like, if you have trouble sitting 20 minutes, you better sit 40. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, please say something uh, about it. Um, so th on the 22nd, Soups, 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 soups. 
There we go. Okay, so on the 22nd, which is Saturday, there is an all-day workshop with um, our favorite teacher, Tenjin Choki. Um, she will be teaching. It's very interactive. I mean, some of us have been in her workshops before. They're very interactive. Um, it's from 9.30 to 4.30, so it's not like a really super long day. There'll be an hour break for lunch. Um, it'll be in this room because of the sound system, and we set it up so it's in a circle. There's um, She likes to have maybe 20 to 25 people, so it's not a real big group. It's pretty small. It's pretty intimate. Um, but it, the, the workshop is on the four immeasurables, um, which are equanimity, loving kindness, compassion, and sympathetic joy. So as Lama said, we cannot really practice this too much. So um, anyway, if you're interested in signing up for the workshop, thank you. <laughs> if you're interested in signing up for the workshop, um, it's on the website. Um, you can see me afterwards. Um, and we're suggesting a donation, but it's um, of $50. If that's not what you can do, then that's fine. We'd love to have you come anyway. So um, see me or the guy that was sitting next to me, Doug, is also doing some of the registration. Yeah, okay. you got it. You nailed it. Hmm? You nailed it. <laughs> I think we still have a, a potluck a little bit, some food like that ritual. Give us that's I'm saying ritual very consciously. So um, mo most of us like to eat at regular times, you know. <laughs> so I love it. So I'll end with dedication. <clears throat> Do the merits of these virtuous actions. May I quickly attain the state of a Guru Buddha and lead all living beings without exception to that enlightened state. May the supreme jewel bodhicitta that has not arisen arise and grow, and may that which has arisen not diminish, but increase more and more. In the land encircled by snow mountains, you are the source of all happiness and good, all powerful chenrezing Tenzin Gyatso. Please remain until samsara ends. May the teachings of the Buddha flourish, and may the upholders of the teachings remain forever. May all migrators achieve happiness, and may they fulfill all their temporary and ultimate goals. Low song, magical display of the deep awareness of all the victorious ones, merciful giver of a stream of profound and vast instructions to the fortunate migrators, please remain always unperishing, unchanging, unfading. Alakteshvara, great treasure of objectless compassion, Manjushri, master of lawless wisdom, Vajrapani, destroyer of the entire host of Maras, Tsongkhapa, crown jewel of the snowy land sages, Losang Dragpa, I make request at your holy feet. Oh,